I need a We're having drink. a family reunion here today, and I'm gone. See some have wondered about Stover family <coughs> history, and Regina has prepared a presentation on it. There's 355 years of history here in the United States. It goes back a long ways of proud history. Most of it right here in Maine. Hard working people. And I'll give the floor to her. And she she can do her thing. I gotta get a drink and it's not the floor, it's the ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, I never was any good at class so participation. Research is... What do you wanna know? No. <laughs> Well, I guess the easiest way to do this is I usually use crib notes, but I don't know if I can even last through my crib notes. <laughs> Sylvester Stover, actually it's Sylvester Stafford Stover. He is believed to be a Stafford, and he got hurt on a boat wreck from here, from England to here. So when the people found him, they asked him what his name was, and he said Stover instead of Stafford. Any relations in Rhode Island are all related to us. They just have the Stafford name. Uh, Sylvester was born January 29th, 1628. He died February 14th, 1690. He came from the parish of Ipswich in England. In 1635, he immigrated to America. This was seven years old. The dates don't correspond with each other, but he had to have been older than being born in 1628. At the age of 12, <clears throat> he was mentioned in a will in York County. Nothing that we can find states what it was mentioned for, but it, it seems that maybe a Stafford may have died and left something to him in a will. By 1649, he bought a tract of land in Cape Nettick at the neck of Cape Nettick River. He went into business with three partners, Paul, Weir, and Powell, and they started the second largest fishery on the eastern coast. During this time, he eventually bought out his partners at 70 plus acres per partner. That's four times. Um, let's see. He, on his track of land, he built a fortified house known as the Stover Garrison. And he also had a home, a grist mill, uh, a marsh, a cranberry bog, and he was a fisherman. In 1652, he married Elizabeth Morton. She was born 1631, and she died 1714 in Syracuse, Massachusetts. They had nine children. Ask me the children, I'd have to cheat for the cheat sheet. <laughs> I'll see where we were. In 1650, in 1655, he was brought, brought in front of the court for fighting with his wife on the Lord's Day. She bidding him to go to Tommy Crockett's and bring her bastard son cheese and bread. In 1666, Elizabeth's mother moved in, and that wasn't too good for Sylvester because the General Court of Massachusetts was going to imprison her for being such a nuisance. <laughs> um, he was a fairy man from 1652 to 1687. If you were inhabitant of York or otherwise known as Georgiana during that time, you paid one pence. If you were a stranger, it was two pence. If he were to carry a beast or a horse, it was four pence per animal. Depends whether he had to get out of the canoe to swim and carry the animal over or whatever it took to use were the only available source of transportation. In 1687, on occasion to visit England, he decided to make his will early because he felt the perils of the voyage and his advance in age, he wanted to be prepared. He may have arrived in England in 1688 or he may have died at sea. No record in England and no record in York. So. I guess all fishermen are buried at sea, so that's probably what happened. His estate on his house alone and the contents was 731 pounds, and today's money would be 50,000, maybe $75,000. Um, he owned 100 acres, just free land, new pasture, 
and the salt marsh. He got 70 plus acres from each of his partners that he bought out, plus 70. I hope everybody's good at math, because I'm already lost. Um, <laughs> 210. <laughs> All right. There will be a quiz later. He, yeah. <laughs> he was granted 30 more acres because somebody owed him some money. They tried to take him to court as being a debtor, but the court decided they, that he wasn't no debtor with the money that he made. So in 1690, when the will was probated, he left his son Dependence, which is our line, three score and ten acres, a grist mill, part of a saw, and part of the Wheelwright Corporation. I couldn't tell you about the fishery if he got part of that or not, but he also got the house that Sylvester built for him upon the land which he, which he lived. And Josiah, which is a Stafford now, he got the same amount. And he got land with a house and a new pasture, but in the will, so that's what told him that he could change with his brother whenever he wanted and whatever. So whoever had what, they could automatically change over. Each of his sons, 20 shillings at eight tenths an ounce, which roughs out five, six hundred dollars maybe. I'm not good in, in math. Now, each of her sons, and she had, uh, she had four sons and five daughters. At the, at, they also had Negroes. They had <coughs> slaves, but Sylvester didn't consider them slaves. He considered them farm hands. Each of them received 10 shillings at eight pence an ounce. The clothes that they wore, the bed that they slept in. And Phoebe was the mother, and she had a son, Jonathan, who received Elizabeth's gun and 10, yep. 10 shillings, this is silver money, and eight ounces, eight, pen, eight pence per ounce. So, and they, she had a daughter, and the daughter's name was Darissa, and she got hers at 18, and Jonathan got his at 21, however wills work today. If you were to add his land and value it, he, like I said, he'd be pretty close to $50,000 in, in our money today. John, his son, had four little boys, the Queen's War lasted between 1688 and 1712, and they were called the Indian Wars. Cape Nettick was great for having those wars, as well as Scotland had.